Today, we've got another guest speaker, the fourth, and next week I'm bringing the word in a new series. But, you know, in baseball, the fourth, uh, the fourth hitter is a cleanup. And so uh, today we've got Pastor Dustin Stradley all the way from Elevation Church in Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, he's going to bring a great word. Now, Victory City, you know how we do. We cheer them on. We get loud. We get vocal. So you have all the permission in the world to say amen, whatever you feel is comfortable. So can we welcome Pastor Dustin Stradley as he comes to the stage. Come on out. It's going to be good. What's up, Victory City Church? Yeah! Oh, my goodness. Kevin, they came ready to worship. You guys, this feels like home. I mean, you guys came to praise Jesus, to get rowdy, to to do it together, and uh, it's an honor to be here. I'm thankful for this opportunity. I don't take it lightly. I get to be a part of Elevation Church based out of Charlotte, North Carolina. Pastor Stephen Furtick is my leader, my boss, my mentor, and I love him. I thank God for him, and I get to, uh, I've been on staff, let's see, eight years now. Eight years I've been on staff at our church. Seven years up in Roanoke, Virginia. Anyone heard of it? Didn't think so? Yep, three of you. (laughs) Small town. Thank you. I love it. Little small town, little 100,000 people. But we saw revival rise up in Roanoke, Virginia. Can I tell you about it? From five people in a basement to seeing over 7,000 people place their faith in Jesus Christ in a city of 100,000. I mean, you guys can celebrate louder than that. That's, that's only a move of God. I remember, Pastor Eric, when we launched our third service. So when you talked about that, it reminded me of, of going from five people in a basement to launching a, our first uh, church service to our second service and then our third service because we didn't have any more seats and that was an issue because these seats represent opportunities for people to experience the grace of God and I remember just seeing thousands of people come to worship Jesus and and that's what I believe is happening right here in this church Victory City Church and that what's happening in this place is going to spill over into your community It's going to spill over into your workplace. It's going to spill over into your family. It's going to spill over into your schools. And so as you guys get ready to launch, what is it, an 830? Did you guys get these little things on your seats? 830, 10 a.m., 1130 a.m. This is an opportunity for you to bring someone you care about into the presence of God to experience what you've gotten to experience. You know that annoying coworker that you avoid (laughs) most days? Maybe that's the exact person that God wants to use you to impact this week. That Starbucks barista, instead of just getting your coffee and putting your head down and running errands, say, you know what? Hey, I appreciate your service. Thank you for your smile. I'd love to invite you to our church. Let's pack out this place next weekend. Why not? Let's see revival of God rise up in Austin, Texas and beyond. And let's see how God wants to use you in your sphere of influence, in your family. Here's the reality. You have a sphere of influence that Pastor Eric and Natalie may not have that some of the teams here may not have. You've got a family, you've got people in your circle that God wants to use you to impact. A simple invitation can lead to significant impact. I've experienced it in my own life, and you don't need a microphone. You don't need a platform to make a difference and reach people for Christ. You can extend them an invite this week and get them into the presence of God and let God do what only God can do. But I believe that before we get to next weekend, we gotta see what God wants to do in your life this weekend. And I believe that he sent me here on an assignment. He's got something specific in store for every single one of you, all those who are here in person and those tuning in online. Let's celebrate all those who are tuning in online who couldn't make it today. You guys can welcome them a little bit better than that. Come on. You know, watching church in their pajamas is better than not watching church at all. So we welcome you and and we celebrate you. And uh, my wife, Maddie, we have been married for two years, let me see, two years, uh, 11 and a half months, uh, 28 days, 32 hours, 15 seconds. Who's counting though, you know? Best thing that's ever happened to me. I wish she was here with me. She's in Orlando, Florida. We just moved from Roanoke to Orlando in February of this year. There's so many people just moving to Florida and Texas and like Austin, baby, let's go. Got that new Tesla center over there. I mean, this place is great. Diverse church. I love this place. That steak we had last night at, what was it again? Salt? Salt grass. I've only forgotten it like 20 times. 
but it was Pat's 16 ounce ribeye that just won my heart over last night at the old salt grass. So hopefully we'll eat some good food again today. And I love the, uh, I love the energy in this place and I love how you lean into the presence of God. Can I dive into the word of God? Good. Cause I'm going to, and I'm excited about it. Are you guys ready to receive it though? The effectiveness of me sharing it is dependent upon your readiness to receive it. So let's get ready to lean in and see what God wants to do. This comes from John 5, verse 1 through 8. John 5, 1 through 8. Don't you love your pastors, by the way? Pastor Eric, Pastor Natalie. Thank God for them. This guy's got so much vision. Like, we were sitting down at dinner last night, and he was just talking about all the things he believes God's going to do. And you are in the best place at the best time to be in alignment with something that is alive and active. And and I really appreciate you. I'm grateful for you. This comes from John 5, 1 through 8. It said, sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now, there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition, everyone say condition, for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me get into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else always seems to get ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and walked. I need you to help me announce my title today. If you can, turn to your neighbor. If you have a neighbor, if not, shout it across the room if you have to. Say, I've tried everything. I've tried everything. Father, we just come to you right now. We're honored to be in your presence, God. Whatever struggle we had this past week, I pray that we can just put it aside just for a few moments to receive your presence, to receive your love, to receive your grace, that we can be receptive to the specific thing that you want to speak into us. It's in Jesus' name that everybody said. Amen. Well, let's grab our flippy floppies, our bathing suits, and our Ray-Bans and head down to the pool of Bethesda. Who doesn't love a good pool party? I know you guys love a good pool party. Let's pick up in verse 3 and see who shows up to the party. It said, here a great number of disabled people used to lie. The blind, the lame, the paralyzed, the cynical. The addict, the perfectionist, the workaholic, the prideful, the people pleaser, people with various conditions. And if I kept listing it out, we could find yours too. We all have conditions that may be crippling us from taking a step into the things that God's called us to. And the reason they're all gathering around the pool is found in verse 4. So let's take a look at verse 4 together. Pull out your Bible if you have it. And let me know when you find it. Say amen. Amen. Found verse 4. Shout amen. Amen. This gentleman over here looks confused. You couldn't find verse 4? Me either. Like I was looking in my NIV version of the Bible. And Pastor Eric, I couldn't find verse 4. I mean, I know you're like a biblical scholar, and, and you probably, you know, knew exactly where verse 4 was, but mine was missing. Maybe my Bible is broken because it went from verse 3 to verse 5. Anybody else have that issue if you're looking at your Bible right now? Yeah, right? It's like 3 to 5, and I was like, okay, so let me look in a different translation of the Bible, and I looked in a different translation of the Bible, and, you know, they forgot to print verse 4 in that translation of the Bible, too, and um, don't worry. I stayed up late. I drank lots of espresso, lots of Red Bull. I found verse 4. So I'm going to read it to you. Cool? All right, I think we have it. We can pull it up on the screen. All right, there it is. It said, from time to time, an angel of the Lord would appear and come down and stir up the waters. The first one in to the pool 
after each such disturbance would be cured of whatever disease they had. But why was it missing from the Bible? Well, really, there was never any proof that it was an angel of the Lord that came down to stir up the water. So that's why it wasn't included in the earlier manuscripts of the Bible, but instead this was more of like a superstition. And, and the reality was the streams of water fed into this pool and due to nature and wind, occasionally the water would be stirred up, there were minerals in the water, and it would provide a medicinal value for those who would get into the water. It's, you know, similar to you bathing yourself in all your favorite essential oils like you like to do, looking for some sort of healing and comfort. And, and the pool to all of these people with various conditions represents comfort. Everyone say comfort. If I can get into the pool first, then I get the comfort that I'm looking for. But the passage really focuses on one man. And in verse 5, it said, one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. Invalid meaning some sort of sickness, some sort of affliction. Maybe he was even paralyzed. And he'd been trying to change his condition for 38 years. And just like the man, we all have conditions. Everyone in your section has a condition. Everyone tuning in online right now has a condition. Maybe it's not a physical condition, but a mental condition, a spiritual condition. Maybe it's a condition of the heart, if we're honest. Can I share one of mine? Because I got plenty. I've got plenty of issues, Pastor Eric. I got plenty of dysfunction, Drew. I could stand up here for the next four days and tell you about all of my conditions. Can I share one with you? Good, because I'm going to. So I've got this one condition that just seems to keep creeping back in all the time. It's the condition of pride, which is really just me overcompensating for an inward insecurity of never feeling like I'm good enough. And somewhere in my little dysfunctional <laughs> mind, I think that, that I can find comfort with the more that I achieve. If I can just achieve like a little bit more, then I'll find contentment. Then I'll find comfort only to realize that it's never enough. What's your condition? Are we going to be honest with each other? Is that, is that too much? Oh, I mean, I, th I thought we were family, you know? Like, because we all have conditions. Like, maybe it's the shame of a decision that you made 10 years ago. And it's still holding you back from stepping into the things that God's called you to. Maybe it's the anxiety that keeps you up all night after you've been scrolling, scrolling, scrolling on your phone, comparing your behind the scenes to everyone else's highlight reels, thinking that no one else has any conditions except for you, <laughs> that they got their life together when reality is we all have conditions. You know, uh, Pastor Eric preached, uh, I wasn't ready. You guys remember that sermon a few weeks back? So good. So helpful. I was watching on YouTube. And he talked about uh, that, your broke down car. Yeah, still broke down? Yeah, still broke down. How long now? Month. Yeah, a month, yeah. It took me back to my uh, 2003 Acura. Praise the Lord, we got rid of it last year. But 246,000 miles, half the windows didn't work, half the AC didn't work, uh, one of the doors didn't work, paint was chipping off on this beast, you know, that kind of that car. My wife and I shared a car. We were on the Dave Ramsey plan just trying to get out of debt, you know, and and uh, so I'm driving this thing down the highway, and I don't know a lot about cars, but the steering wheel, this is a few years back, begins to, sh like, rapidly shake as I'm driving down the car or driving down the highway. And, uh, and I realized that's probably not a good sign. So I whip that Acura over into a gas station, get out. Sure enough, the tire's about to pop. So pop open the trunk. I see the spare tire. Stare at it for a moment. And then I had a, an, an epiphany. I don't know how to change a tire. Don't judge me. And I'm about to get married to my wife at that point in 26 days. And I, as a 32-year-old man, have to stand before my wife not knowing how to change a tire? Not on my watch. So first things first, owner's manual. Toss it out. Who needs it? I'm a guy, right? I got this. Grab the spare tire. Go to the front of the car, get down, use the tools out of the trunk, successfully pull off the tire that's about to pop. Get ready to put the spare tire on. As I'm about to put it on, the whole car begins to shift in midair, falls over on the ground. First things first. I'm like, anybody see that? 
We good? <laughs> that was a little embarrassing. <laughs> so then I'm able to knock the jack out from underneath the car, and I'm like, all right, second time's a charm. Like, you know, I got this. Like, no big deal. This probably happens to everybody who's changing a tire. Get ready to put the spare tire onto the car. Mid-air again, the car begins to shift and falls over on the ground. Six times. Six times the car falls over on the ground. Four hours later, I eventually just sit down in the parking lot late at night. I pull my man card out of my wallet and just toss it in the wind <laughs> and just accept the fact that I'm never going to be able to change a tire until I see this big Jack Diesel camouflage truck with American flags <laughs> pull into the gas station parking lot. And then these four Jack Diesel country boys get out of the car, begin to walk towards me. I'm frightened at this point. And they say, hey, man, you know, but they're, 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 they're a tire, boy. <laughs> no idea what you just said. And they reach down in their own effort and literally just pick the side of the car up and slide this little donut tire onto my vehicle. And I said, yeah, bro, that was my next move. I'm just taking a break. <laughs> and, uh, like, what I couldn't try hard enough to do in my own effort, they did with ease when they showed up on the scene. And this man in this passage, he was trying. And we learn a lot about how we tend to cope with our own conditions as we take a look at his life. And so I want to give you two ways we tend to cope with our conditions. Can I do that? Any overachievers like to take notes in this place? You're going to write this down? Awesome. The first is the comfort of trying. The comfort of trying. Now, I'm not saying that trying is always a bad thing. Like, you're trying to get your finances in order and you're putting a budget together. That's a good thing. You're trying to get in the best shape of your life and you're trying keto this, dairy-free this, sugar-free that, whatever. That's a good thing. Trying to be the best mom you can be, that's a good thing. Trying to be the best husband you can be, that's a good thing. But I'm talking about the kind of trying dev that we see in verse 4. The first one in wins mentality that we have in our culture. And I don't know about you, but when I read the Bible, I like to put myself, Kevin, in the story of the Bible. And, and I like to visualize what it must have been like to, to be all of these people with these various conditions just laying out by the pool. Can I crawl down on the stage for a minute? Okay, good, because I am. And uh, I asked permission, but then I'm, I'm going to do it anyway. So. so, oh gosh, yep, okay. So you've got all of these people with various conditions. I imagine this invalid who had been there for 38 years, he's laying out by the pool, he's tanning his backside, and he's just waiting for the water to be stirred up. If he can get from here to there, he's going to find the comfort that he's looking for. And let's just say that he's paralyzed from the waist down. And it's the first one in that gets the healing, the first one in that gets the comfort. So you know that there's some aggression taking place. Like, you know that as he's trying to crawl his way down, he's elbowing people, he's scratching people, he's yelling at people. I mean, if you get close enough to the water, I'm just going to hold you under for a minute just to get you out of the way. Like, do whatever it takes to get the comfort, especially after 38 years. Like, I'm going to do whatever it takes to try to get into that water to experience the comfort I'm looking for. But don't we do the same thing in our culture? Like, if I can work just a little bit harder, then I'll have enough money to get that house, and then I'll have the contentment that I'm looking for. If I can just work a little bit harder, then I'll have the followers, then I'll have the likes. If I can just try a little bit harder, then I'll have that house. If I can just work a little bit harder, maybe if I compromise some values along the way, and I just open myself up and sleep around, then that person will accept me. If I can just work a little bit harder, then I'll have the comfort that I'm looking for. And... It wasn't for lack of trying. This guy was trying. And some of you, not only have you tried, but you made it to the pool. And you got in. But you realize it wasn't all you thought it would be. You've got more money than you thought possible. But you're still completely empty on the inside. You've got the popularity. You've got the influence, yet you're still crying yourself to sleep at night. We find comfort in trying to force a solution to figure it out. I don't want to invite anyone. I don't want anyone to see 
my behind the scenes. I got a phone call in, I believe it was 2015, from Wade Joy. He's our worship pastor at Elevation Church. And uh, Wade said, hey, Dustin, um, Pastor Stephen and I, we see an anointing on your life. We see a gift on your life. And, and we want to give you the opportunity to preach the gospel to the entire church. And I said, stop it. He said, stop what? I said, no, like, are you for real? He was like, yeah, I'm being for real. Like, why, uh, uh, and that was a big deal for me, y'all. I mean, you see me holding a microphone now, but at that point, I'd never preach to anybody before. And in fact, I was addicted to alcohol for eight years of my life. I went to jail multiple times. I hated church. I hated Christians. I was running from God. I believed that there was a God, but God couldn't love someone like me, especially based on all the conditions that I had and all the decisions that I had made. So then someone in 2009 threw me in the car. His name is Brett. He was my roommate. And he said, I'm taking you to church. And that was four days after I got out of jail. And I said, I don't do church. He said, well, you really don't have an option. You don't have a license right now, and you don't have a car because you just got your second DUI. You're coming to church. And so he brought me to a church just like this. It was Elevation Church in August of 2009. I got saved in that church. I got baptized in that church. I started greeting in that church, holding the door, smiling, high-fiving, welcoming people to church. And now I've been on staff at Elevation for almost nine years, a pastor for almost nine years. And now he's going to give me the opportunity to preach the gospel? And share with everyone else about the grace of God and what it could do for my life. And it could do it for you too. I said, yes, Wade, I'll preach. And then I hung up the phone. Well, I said, thank you, Wade. Like, and then I hung up the phone. <laughs> so then I went to the church office, closed the door. I'm staring at a whiteboard. I had another epiphany. <laughs> Sometimes it takes me a second. I said, I don't know how to write a sermon. <laughs> so I've got two options. One, I can tell Pastor Stephen and Wade uh, that I don't know how to preach, but then I might lose the opportunity. But they see something in me, so maybe I should go with option number two and just figure it out. My condition kicked in. So for the next four weeks, I lock myself in that church office, and I'm reading through every translation of the Bible. You can imagine I'm memorizing scripture. I'm slapping anointing oil all over my face. I'm speaking in tongues. I'm on my hands and knees crying out to God, studying communicators and preachers. And, and then I went on a four-night binge of just chugging as much caffeine as possible, staying up till 4 a.m. I said, you're going to either have to carry me out, Dev, on a stretcher, or I'm going to walk out of this room with a sermon in hand to the point that I fell on my knees. And I'm like, this is exhausting. Like, how does Pastor Eric do this every single week? But don't we do the same thing? Like, in our own effort, just try to figure it out. Like, I'm going to work myself into the ground until I come up with a solution, and I'm going to provide, and I'm going to figure this thing out. And so sometimes we get to a place of, like, man, is there a different way? Is there a better way? And that's exactly where we find this man in this passage. 38 years of trying to fix this condition. With no progress. I mean, you're on a, a diet plan, and you might not see the progress you want over the first six months, but you might see a little, a pound or two. My guy saw zero progress for 38 years of trying. And this is when Jesus shows up on the scene. And Jesus asked an interesting question, to say the least. And I always find it interesting when Jesus asks a question because he is the son of God, <laughs> pretty smart guy, and uh, God knows a lot of things. So he's probably not asking the question because he needs the information. He's probably well aware. But maybe he's trying to ask the question to produce faith in the man. Maybe he's asking the question so that the man will begin to think a little bit differently. And in verse 6, Jesus saw this man lying there and learned that he had been in this condition. Everyone say condition for a long time. So he asked him, do you want to get well? Do you want change? And I believe that God's asking some of you that same question today. Do you want to get well? Do you really want change. Maybe Jesus realized that this man had just accepted that change wasn't possible for him, not based on his condition. 
Maybe this man, after 38 years of trying, we learn a lot about his attitude, had just accepted the fact that maybe this is the way it will always be. Maybe change isn't possible for me. There's a level of comfort that we find sometimes in acceptance, especially after trying for so long. Maybe I should just accept that I'll never have it together. Can we talk about the comfort of acceptance? The comfort of acceptance, I want you to write that down. And although Jesus' question was interesting, I thought the man's response was also interesting to say the least. Like, let's put ourselves in, in his boat, okay? If I'm laying there for 38 years, trying to get into this pool, trying to find comfort, Maybe he didn't even know it was Jesus and didn't know what Jesus was capable of. But if anyone showed up, <laughs> Jesus or not, and said, hey, man, you want to get well? I would think, like, my response would be a little different. Like, well, yeah, bro. Like, what do you think I'm doing laying out by the pool? <laughs> like, duh. Like, if I get into the water, I'm going to get the comfort I'm looking for. Like, who's this guy? Like, what's this guy asking me this question for? Like, it's pretty obvious why we're all hanging out at the pool. But instead, this is how he responds in verse 7. He said, sir, as I can imagine with a tone of defeat, I have no one to help me. And everyone just always seems to get ahead. Has this man after 38 years just said, you know, I've already tried everything. And maybe some of you are saying the same thing like, Maybe I should just accept that this is all our marriage will ever be. We'll never be able to get on the same page. Ah, I should just accept that I'll always live paycheck to paycheck. It's easier to live in the comfort of dysfunction than it is to embrace the uncertainty of change. If we're just being real. Like, I mean, I, I know that sometimes after trying for so long to, to change a certain condition, it's easier for me just to surround myself with other dysfunctional people who have the same condition so I don't have to keep trying to change. <laughs> it's so exhausting. I'm like, okay, I'm done with that. So, you know, I'm broke, you're broke. Hey, let's be broke together. You know, like, I guess it's just the way it is. Well, you know, I'm out of shape. But, you know, I'm overweight, you're overweight. Like, let's just, hey, let's, whatever. And we surround ourselves with other people who have similar conditions to us, so we don't have to go through the pain and the uncertainty of change. And that's exactly where we find this man, and maybe that's where some of you are today. As well, does, does anyone even care anymore? I, I don't know. Some of you are on the brink of giving up and just accepting that I don't know if God can love someone like me. If you knew what I've done, if you knew what I've been through, if you know how long I've been trying to fix my kids and, and they've still rebelled over the past 15 years, I, I don't, I've lost hope and I'm finding comfort and acceptance. Remember that sermon I was telling you about that I was about to preach? Yeah? The one I told you, like, it was just like five minutes ago. So I got ready to preach it and uh, I was in a room just like this. And I was going to preach it, it was like five days prior to preaching it to the whole church. I was doing it in front of just a few of our, our pastors and staff. And um, I'm going to jump off stage. Can I stand on this, this one before I jump over to the next one? <laughs> Whew. <laughs> we made it. Praise the Lord. So I'm standing in a room like this, and you guys earlier were worshiping God. And it was such a beautiful thing to see your hands lifted. And we were doing the same thing. And just... You know, champion, and this is why I don't lead worship. And, uh, and I was about to go up and preach, and it was like someone in the room at that point in time, it was like Pastor Eric was like, hey, Dustin, you got this, man. I believe in you. You preach that word. Like, you've been preparing. God's going to use you. And I was like, yeah, yeah, let's go, baby. And then, I, you know, somebody like my wife was like, hey, I believe in you. God's hands on you. You're about to go. I was like, let's go. I was getting hyped, you know. Like, even preachers got to get hyped sometimes, you know. It's like connecting with Jesus, getting ready to just unleash what he wants to speak through you. So I got ready to run up on stage, and. And uh, I was like, I don't know what's about to come out my mouth, but okay, let's see what happens. And so I just start going after. And I was like, God loves you. He believes in you. Da -da 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 -da. And uh, 
I had a clock of 30 minutes. So I can't go over 30 minutes, and I can't go under 30 minutes. 12 minutes in, I ran out of things to say. <laughs> oh, like I was on stage, like, oh, God, uh, like throwing up in my mouth. Like I blacked out. I choked. I had nothing else to say. And the 12 minutes that I did speak, it didn't make any sense. I don't even know what I said. So pretty quickly, I said, like, hey, guys, thanks for coming. I'm out. <laughs> And uh, I'm going to head home. And I get home, look down, phone rings. It's Wade. I was like, okay, I'm going to lose the opportunity to preach. Like I knew before I even picked up that phone, man, I I royally screwed this up. And I'm going to lose this opportunity to preach. So sure enough, I pick up the phone. I don't have a flip phone. I don't know why I keep using a flip phone. But I, I pick up the phone and. And I did. I lost the opportunity. I mean, you had to have somebody say something. Like, people are coming to church ready to receive the word of God. And we had to bring somebody else in to speak that weekend. So first things first, um, we get off the phone. I slam it into the passenger seat of my 2003 Acura trying to break it because that's going to help. And then I don't cry often. Uh, Maybe a little bit more now that I'm married. I'm a little more sensitive nowadays. (laughs) But uh, this day... I ugly cried. Like, you know the kind of cry where you've got, like, snot, like, all over your face. I mean, you're hyperventilating. (laughs) You know, like, that kind of cry. And uh, I'm just trying to, like, because I got to drive the car to get home. And because I was at a gas station, and I'm just trying to, like, get the tears out of my eyes just enough. And I look across the street, and I don't eat fast food. I try to eat, you know, real clean. I got some intolerances and stuff. But I saw an Arby's. I whipped that Acura over to Arby's so quick. I got an extra large roast beef sandwich, curly fries, and sweet tea, and yammed that down as I whipped my Acura over to Starbucks and got four birthday cake pops. I yammed down every one of those cake pops on my way home before I ordered a Papa John's pizza, sat on the couch, watched Full House, not Fuller House, the real deal OG Full House, (laughs) ate every slice of that pepperoni pizza as tears trickled down my cheek onto each one of those pepperonis. (sighs) And I just remember having this, this moment of uh, feeling like, man, I tried. But I just need to accept that, like, maybe I'll never be good enough. I mean, I'm definitely not going to get the opportunity to preach again. Definitely not going to get the opportunity to lead people again. All these things that can go through your mind when you're in this place of, of embarrassment and devastation. So I uh, curl up in fetal position with my body pillow, cry myself to sleep that night. Wake up the next day, phone rings, Pastor Stevens calling me this time. And I'm like, cool, I'm probably getting fired now. I don't know. <laughs> when it rains, it pours. My mind goes to it. <laughs> I don't know if you're like me. Maybe it's just me. I got <laughs> these conditions, man. You know, my mind can go to the worst places, worst case scenarios. I pick up the phone. He said, how you doing? I said, not good. Um, I was embarrassed. And maybe you're thinking to yourself, oh, you, you lost the opportunity to preach. What a big deal. You don't know what I'm going through. All right, imagine you were about to get a promotion at work, and your family's throwing you a surprise party. And you show up at home, and the door slings open, balloons fly. And it's like, surprise! And you're like, I uh, didn't get the promotion. I screwed it up. It was embarrassing for me. I said, Pastor, um, I feel like I let God down. I feel like I let you down. I feel like I let our church down. And uh, what he said next is something I'll remember for the rest of my life. He said, Dustin, I love you. I'm proud of you for who you are, not what you achieve or what you accomplish. He said, I believe in you. And at some point, you're going to get another chance. From my leader in that moment, after I tried so hard without inviting anyone in to help me, for him to step in and say, you're going to get another chance. It's bump volumes to me. And then for the next 30 minutes, he was at his son's baseball game, and he took time. They had a little intermission in the game. He walked me through how to clearly hear from God and how to try to articulate that and how to structure together a message and speak to different people from all walks of life and 
and it meant the world to me. And we find this man in this passage. He tried for 38 years in his own effort to find the comfort and the healing that he's looking for. And it said that the man was laying at the pool of Bethesda. Bethesda means house of grace. This pool was surrounded by five beautiful columns. The number five in the Bible represents the number of grace. This man was laying in the presence of grace all along but had never received grace. Jesus knew that the man would never make it to the pool. That's why Jesus came to him. The man thought grace was in the pool, but grace wasn't in the pool. Grace was in the person. The man had come to the end of himself and that's where grace begins when you come to the end of you that's where grace begins how long would you keep trying to change your condition before you let God change the condition of your heart Jesus showed up and said I knew you would never make it he went to get grace the man he went to get grace Grace came to him. And God's grace has come to you today. You can't earn it. You can't work hard enough for it. I tried all that. Trust me. I tried the whole religion thing, like let's do good, not do bad, and maybe I can earn the grace of God, and, and maybe he'll love me more. You can't earn it. God's grace is a gift, and it's available for you freely if you'll receive it. Jesus knew that he would not find what he was looking for. Even if he made it to the pool, he would miss out on the bigger blessing and the grace that God wanted to bring into his life. And Jesus looks at him in verse 8 after 38 years of trying to figure it out in his own effort. And he said, stand to your feet, pick up your mat and walk. And the man, after 38 years, jumped to his feet and began to walk. It was God's grace that got him up. It was God's grace that got him up. And God's grace is here for you right now. God's grace wants to get you up out of your depression. God's grace can get you up out of your anxiety. God's grace is sufficient for all your needs. God's grace is sufficient for your pain. God's grace is sufficient for your anxiety. God's grace is bigger than your frustration. God's grace is bigger than your bitterness. God's grace is here for you. You can't earn it. You can't outrun it. God loves you. He wants to have a relationship with you if you'll just receive it. The Bible says that it's by grace through faith that you have been saved. It's a gift from God. But just like any gift, you have to receive it gift is available. Well, you know, I'm trying though, man. I'm, you know, I'm coming to church. And, you know, I'm trying. I tried the whole God thing, tried the whole church thing, and it worked for them, but I don't know if it can work for someone like me. And our posture is clenched fists and arms closed. And, but if you'll just open your heart and receive the grace that God wants to bring into your life, and I'm not just talking about for those who've never experienced the grace of God. There's some of you who've never experienced the grace of God. And someone made you come to church today because they told you they were going to buy you lunch afterwards. And you're like, I don't even want to be here. Like, I'm just trying to be a good friend. But God's grace, oh my goodness, it can change everything. God loves you so much. Yeah, but you don't know what I did. Even just last night, it doesn't matter. He sent his son to die for you and to rise again so that you could have that grace too, so that you could have freedom in Christ. God's grace is big enough for you too. But for some of you, maybe it's maybe you've been walking with God your entire life. Yeah, man, I've heard about the grace of God and love of God, and I know all the scripture you can even think of, and I've already memorized the whole Bible and every translation you can think. But we need grace too. 
every day, every moment, minute by minute, second by second. Some of you are really good at extending grace to others, but really bad at extending grace to yourself. Yeah, we're called to serve people, but also God created you in his image. And for you, I believe you're going to extend and receive fresh grace over your own life. Quit being so hard on yourself. You're doing so much better than you realize. Yeah, I'm trying to be the best mom I can be, man, but it's hard. Give yourself some grace. God's with you. He loves you. And he's for you. And I believe there are some of you in this room today that need to receive the grace of God for the first time in your life. And start a relationship with Jesus Christ. We want to give you that opportunity right now. Whether you're tuning in online today or five years from now or you're in this auditorium right now. God's grace is here. It came to you. You've been trying to hide. God sees you. He sees all your mess. And he loves you anyway. You can't change that. 